Hello and welcome to. Matter of fiction. I'm your host Rory Cook, and in this program we impart strange truths and concoct weird lies. This week we are live from Isengard, and on tonight's show we have on Team Star. He's got the key and the secret, Gareth Monk. Good to be here. And his guest tonight reduces seven signs of aging, Phil Carruthers. Clean up on aisle five. Welcome. And on Team Knight, we have Team Captain. Just can't wait to be king, Victoria Rice. It's true. And her guest with limited time left, Joshua Pink. Lemon cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger Than Fiction is the first round. Each team is given a real but ridiculous fact. They then make up the other two facts within 30 seconds, and the other team must guess which is the actual fact. So I'll just give the teams their facts. There you go. There you go. And you have 30 seconds whilst I talk, and your 30 seconds starts now. So this is round four of the series, and we've had three before, and there's going to be two after this one. And group A is still undecided, and group B, which is what we have currently, if Gareth and Phil win, they will go through to the final. If the they sign of affection, <laughs> really. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Like a um, yeah. This is a reminder of our competition. <laughs> Email your answer to studio at Storm FM. Okay, teams, you've had 30 seconds, <coughs> so I'll kick off with Team Star. That's Gareth and Phil. Do you want to reveal your facts, please? Uh, yes, our facts are all themed around aviation and animals thereof. Uh, first fact is the Jump jets from Harrier jump jets were originally tested by seeing how many pigs they could lift. Uh, our second fact is that Boeing has a chicken firing cannon. And <laughs> our final fact is that a short lived Japanese airline in the 1970s tried to train gorillas to be pilots. <laughs> <laughs> Which and was the first one again? The jump jets from Harriers were originally tested by seeing how many pigs they could lift. And why specifically pigs for this? There's lots of pigs in the world. Essentially, you can't. So your assertion is the most expendable thing in the world is pigs. Well, pigs need moving from time to time, so what better way to fly them <laughs> uh, around? Okay, moving on to the second one then. Mm -hmm. Firing firing chickens into aeroplanes. Presumably it's to test uh, it, it. Yeah, it's a chicken firing cannon, I think. It's so what, to what purpose? I believe the underlying principle is that it tests how... Well, what would happen if... Well, not a chicken, obviously, because they don't <laughs> tend to live in the sky, but a birdie thing with wings and stuff. What would happen if one were to crash into, like, the windscreen or the engine? I would have thought it was just to see how far a chicken would go if you fired it out of a cannon. I like that idea. But is this chicken a live chicken? Is it a frozen chicken? Is it a defrosted chicken? Feathers or no feathers? This is Boeing. I'm pretty sure the chicken is dead before they fire it. <laughs> I think Boeing have got enough money to spare to use whatever chickens they want. If I'm being honest. <laughs> so you research that the Ministry of Defence had spare money for pigs. <laughs> Boeing has spare money for chickens. Where is all this money coming from for disposable animals? The aviation industry every year deliberately makes a lot of cuts just so they can spend more money on animals, Josh. It's a well-known fact. <laughs> well, exactly. I think in America the starting salary for a pilot is about ten thousand dollars. So. The industry does have a lot of money, so it's obviously spending it on livestock. I mean, it'd be stupid to suggest otherwise. <laughs> OK, fact three. And I'm going to try and get the tone of voice right for this one. Gorilla pilots. Yep. Why? Well, it's an interesting subject. You know, by the 1970s, the kind of novelty of flying, I guess, is wearing off. And there's <laughs> lots of <and> airlines. <laughs> airlines are a saturated market, so this young, budding, fledgling... Japanese airline just thinks, how can we set ours apart from the crowd? Gorillas? Okay, I can live with pigs and chickens being expendable just. Gorillas aren't expendable. There are not spare gorillas around. Have you ever seen a gorilla in a pilot suit? It's pretty hilarious. No. Victoria, <laughs> you haven't lived. There's a very good reason why they wouldn't have a gorilla as a pilot, and that's because gorillas have lice, and these lice are the same lice that are the same as our pubic lice. You don't have to go near them. Yeah, they're in the pilot. They're separated. You know, they're in the cockpits. They're locked in. <laughs> That's the reason you can't go in cockpits on planes anymore. How successful was this program? Um, well, it was short-lived. Um, it was about three weeks. I expect the gorillas were short-lived. Yes. Oh no, no, the airline was short-lived. <laughs> okay, so what, what have we got? We have um, Japanese people massacring gorillas, Boeing <laughs> massacring chickens, or who was massacring the pigs? Uh, jump, Harrier jumpers. Harrier jumpers. Not necessarily killing the pigs, though. I bet you they died. 
we never implicated pig death in our fact. We don't condone pig death, do we, Phil? Oh, no, and exactly. And swineicide is essentially just deferred bacon. <laughs> 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 okay, Team Knight, do you want to have a guess as to which is the real one? Well, I'm, I'm going to say it's not the gorilla one, because that, that's frankly mm. just silly. And so. I'm thinking not the pigs. I quite like the idea of the chickens, to yeah. be perfectly honest. I still think they would just use weights instead of live pigs, so I, I would think the chicken one, yeah. I'd say we'd go with the chicken one. Okay, Team Star, do you want to reveal? You are correct. Boeing does, uh, in fact, have a woo. chicken firing cannon. Okay, Team Knight, you've got two points there for getting on your first guess. But can you reveal your facts? Okay. The first one is the shepherds followed Jupiter and not the star to find Jesus. Okay. The second one is that King Herod wasn't actually born until after Jesus. And the third one is there weren't three wise men in the nativity. I refuse to believe that my schooling had lied to me <laughs> when I did the nativity. Schools always lie. I didn't learn anything by being smart. A little advert there for education in the UK. To be fair, um, school nativity plays lie on a regular basis. I mean, in mine, we were led to believe that a donkey saved the day. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Jesus that was the Messiah, not the donkey. <laughs> and I was a dancing sheep who also sang. I was Joseph and I wore a dress. <laughs> Our wise men, I remember in year five, were all on those metal folding scooters that were really popular in like, <gasps> 1999. Oh, you were at the coolest school place! <laughs> <laughs> I went to an all-boys school, which made the Mary interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one was that the shepherds did not follow the star, they followed Jupiter uh -huh. instead. Um, is Jupiter particularly visible in the night sky? Yes. At certain times, yes. And the important thing is, it actually does move in the st sky. Stars say fixed, planets move. That's you can follow them. I pretty much vouch that Jupiter was around at the time of Jesus as well. And the other facts, there was the third one I remember was that there were not three wise men present at the nativity. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So, well, was it like two wise men and one not so wise man, or mm. just three men? No, they were just not there. There was actually a large group of about 30 people who had come from, from Arabia. So we divide it by ten, and you get three, and it fits with the school nativity. Were all thirty of them wise? Was it like was it like a Mensa day out or something? <laughs> yes, because that's the only situation in which thirty people stay together. Now, if you're a king, <laughs> which <laughs> they were, you don't travel on your own across the desert. You bring attendants with you. You don't bring twenty nine other kings because that makes you an even bigger target. So <laughs> they, <laughs> they would have also had to have all their tents and things like that, so they'd need man servants and whatever. It was just pop-up tents. They would have been fine. They <laughs> weren't like nothing. I guess it does make sense that the other 27 have kind of been culled from history because because we've got a whole kind of nice list of three gold, frankincense and myrrh. The, the, <laughs> well, no one can remember the gold, frankincense, myrrh and fondue sets. And, <laughs> and the last one was like potassium and you know, the lithium and non-valuable things. Herod wasn't born until after Jesus. Right. What proof do you have of this? Herod was a real king. Thus, we know when he was born from court records, for example, of the period. But I'm sure Christians would dispute that Jesus was a real messiah. Yes, but that's because Jesus wasn't a king. Thus, there aren't vast amounts of documentation describing when he lived. I thought he was king of all kings. I thought that was the point. I'm sure you're aware the Bible says, there may be a kingdom for me somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Oh, yeah, I remember that part of the Bible. If we're going to start quoting stuff, then I'm just going to leave, because it's getting far too intelligent for me. I was actually quoting Jesus Christ Superstar, so not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, I think we'll take a guess, and it's, it's which one's real. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that King Herod is the, the true one. The King Herod is the true one. Okay, Team Knight, do you want to reveal? That is not correct. Oh. Um, okay, you've got another guess. Let's get a <sighs> So it was three wise men or Jupiter. Jupiter. Whilst they're thinking, I'll point out that King Herod actually died before Jesus was born. Is this in Jesus Christ Superstar or the Bible? <laughs> He was alive in Jesus Christ Superstar, if a little camp. <laughs> a little camp? Weren't we all? Alive, I mean, not a little camp. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if you meant camp or in Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think out of the two, it was the not, there were 30 wise men, not three wise men, and that they were following Jupiter and not the stars. I would say the more reasonable of those and the more logical of those would be the Jupiter star one. What do you think, Phil? I, yeah, I'm going to have to side with you on that one. 
Good, good. Okay, right, well, I think that the shepherds were following Jupiter and not the stars. I think that's the true one. Okay, Josh and Victoria, can you reveal? You are incorrect. Oh, <laughs> what? No, wait. Oh, no, this is nonsense. This is rubbish. This is... This, that can't be true. How is... Who are these other 27 wise men that were mentioned? It's like, you know, when they shot the rocket into space. If you want the truth, it just uses a plural term and specifies nothing about numbers in the Bible. Oh, those jammy gits. Those, that's just lazy writing. Even Dan Brown writes better fiction than that. Maybe that's why he's anti-church <laughs> propaganda. Yes, for example, in all modern stories, when you say there's a field of sheep, you always specify exactly how many sheep there are, don't you? Sheep are not integral to a plot most of the time. The number of wise men are because they have gifts and things and Jesus was there. It was an important date in the calendar, Jesus' birth, and I'd expect there to be some clarification over numbers. Did they RSVP 30 back or something like that? This is ridiculous. We know there was one Jesus and one Messiah. This sums up the numbers we need to know from that story. So at the end of that round... Uh, team Star of None and uh, Team Knight managed to get two, so well done. Oh. Round two, Cats and Nazis. This game is for tonight's guests. That's Phil and Josh. Each guest is given four unrelated topics that, which they must link up via simple logical steps to form a story which lasts a minute. And we'll start with Josh. And his words are Prague, Lollipop, Motorbike, and Xylophone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And your minute starts now. Whilst working as an English or foreign language teacher in the Czech Republic, the beautiful city of Prague, which has much fine graffiti from the time of the Soviet Union, I went into a shop selling board games. <laughs> I decided I wanted to purchase something to take back from my parents, possibly a new form of card game. However, on entering, I saw a very creepy man standing behind the counter with a child. He was holding a lollipop, seeming to try and lure the child into the back room of the store. I was deeply concerned by this, ran out onto the street to try and find some help. So this, was, this is somewhat unnerving, particularly in a city with a reputation of quite a high crime area. I found a policeman riding a motorbike on the street past me. I tried to stop him. Unfortunately, he only appeared to speak Czech. Well, I assume he was Czech. It was some kind of Slavic East European language that I cannot understand. I, I expect, as a policeman in Czech Republic, it was Czech. So I, ra I ran down the street. I had to attract some attention. I, I went to a music instrument shop. I thought, I'd get a drum. I'll bang on a drum. This will attract some attention. They had no drums. They had no pianos. They had no trumpets. What did they have? They had one useful instrument. I ran out to the street. I shouted at the top of my voice. And I played to attract attention this xylophone. <laughs> oh, well done, well done, very good. Very good. All I could say is I'm glad I didn't take a gap year if that's what the world is like as a whole. That's just Prague. <laughs> I really need to broaden my horizons. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Phil, it's your turn. And your words are cheese, hot air balloon, dream, and fire drill. Wondrous. And your minute starts now. Cheese is something, as anyone who knows me knows, is something that is very, very unequivocally close to my heart in a very completely non-creepy way. <laughs> in fact, I have a recurring kind of ambition to combine my two loves of cheese and aviation by eating some cheese toasties in a hot air balloon. <laughs> However, given that my own life is largely unfulfilling and I spend my evenings largely alone, staring at the walls, occasionally chewing soft furnishings. <laughs> this is relegated exclusively to my dreams. <laughs> I remember that my dreams are often disturbed during my first year at university for several reasons. One was because I'd recently discovered binge drinking and <laughs> I'd slept for about 18 hours a day most days. And the other thing that disturbed them was those good old lovely fire drills. <laughs> well done. Can I just point out that people thought my story was dark? Mine had what could have been an entirely innocent man giving his child a sweet. Fills us up the despair and hopelessness of life. <laughs> <laughs> so you only choose soft furnishings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, since I had those five fillings, I realised that chewing hard furnishings isn't for me and will likely lose my deposit. <laughs> <laughs> Josh. I would assume you'd like to make less markings on hard furnishings than soft furnishings. <laughs> you chew an iron bar, you're not going to damage it. Because when has an iron bar been a furnishing? And see, the thing is, if you choose soft furnishings, well, it depends on how soft the furnishings are. If it's something really soft, like curtains, you can just wash them and no one's any the wiser. But if it's something like a sofa, <laughs> if, you, if you have a really powerful hoover, you can just suck all of the bite marks out and everyone thinks you're a perfectly responsible human being. <laughs> Phil, I'm so glad I don't share a house with you. <laughs> just, Phil, why are the edges of the curtains down? No reason! Nothing. I haven't been doing anything whilst you've been at lectures. 
Okay, the end of that round. I'm going to give a point of peace. <laughs> and Phil promised to stop eating the furniture. <laughs> round three, collaborative fiction. This round is for everyone, played in their team pairs. Each has been given a word or topic that no one else knows, and together each pair tell a story incorporating their word, but skillfully concealing it as they cannot mention their actual word or related words. Teammates will guess each other's word. So we'll start with Team Star, that is Gareth and Phil. I'll give them their words. Only the audience at home can hear this. Phil's word is Denmark, and he cannot say Viking or describe the location of Denmark. And Gareth's word is mouse, and he cannot say mice, rats, rodent, cheese, elephants, cats, Tom and Jerry, or other famous cats or mice. Okay, we'll go <sighs> oh joy. back and forth, and we'll start with... Phil. Okay. And your story starts Revenge wasn't enough. Revenge wasn't enough for the people of the place that was a place. <laughs> <laughs> for they had had a plague put upon them. A plague of these uh, small creatures creatures with tails and ears um, who were plaguing them. Most plaguily. <laughs> uh, the place was indeed being plagued by such bizarre antiquities as bacon and Lego. <laughs> but, but fortunately, uh, on the edge of town, a mysterious gentleman stood there with a pipe on his back and a hat on his head, and he said, I will lead away this plague, for I am a man who plays pipes to lead things away. <laughs> the things he was trying to lead away were sentient bacon, and he <laughs> had built his pipe out of a popular plastic building block material popular with children, which was made in a place. <laughs> However, this sentient bacon did not come from pigs. It came from a different type of animal. Uh, a type of animal that would like the sound of pipes and of the product, a byproduct of cows. The end. Okay, Gareth, um, do you think you can have a stab at <laughs> Bill's it's, word? It's, it's a place and it's a place. It's uh, a place, yeah. It was, it was a place, place in place. And it, it's a popular building material, which I'm guessing is Lego. And well, he did actually say Lego. No, he didn't. It could be Mega Blocks, but no kid liked No, he Megablocks. definitely said Lego. Oh, he did say yeah. Lego. Oh, you also mentioned pigs a lot. Don't forget the pigs. Yeah, there was bacon involved. Bacon and Lego, it sounds like my ideal place. I think I, 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 think I can take a guess. Was Phil's Denmark? It, it was. was. Yeah. Hey. Well done. Phil. Uh, did you get that? Oh, well, it's, it's bacon and Lego. That's what Denmark's known for. <laughs> so, Phil, do you want to have a guess? So, we've got... A man with pipe and ha is that the pipe piper of Hamelin? That was related, sort of, to the fact, but that was not the the, the word. That was not the actual word. <laughs> Gareth, do you want to repeat some of your facts? Okay, uh, I mean there were there were creatures. They're small. They have ears, tails, um, and, and, they, and the pipe piper tried to get rid of them. Yeah. Ah, could they by any chance be rats? No. No. <laughs> so close. Mice. Yay. Yes. Okay, you I'm got bad. two points there. You both got it in the end in your two guesses. Okay, we move on to Team Knight. Are you ready? Yes! yes. I've got your <laughs> words here. <laughs> That's the sort of thing we want. Uh, Only the audience at home can hear this. Josh's word is telepathy, and he cannot say thoughts, mind, brain, speak, or talk. And Victoria's word is steam train, and she cannot say coal, rails, railway, or station. <clears throat> okay, we'll go back and forth. We'll start with Victoria, and your story starts. The virus was spreading. The virus was spreading. There was only one way to escape, and it was coming over the hill. I found the man who was responsible for this cruel act, and I thought, I need to understand why he's done this. I need to find some way to reach into the inner recesses of his subconscious and pluck out that information. The only way to do this was to travel through time. It was like back to the future all over again. <laughs> Using this high technology, I thought, maybe if I put him on an MRI machine, I'll be able to read his brainwaves and understand what's going on. Public transport was clearly the best way to use an MRI scan. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, there was not sufficient power to activate the technology on this platform, so I had to find a more low-tech solution to see these things. Fossil fuels were clearly the best way to go about this. What? The end. <laughs> Okay, Josh, do you want to guess Victoria's? No, no, I really don't. I have absolutely no idea. Okay, um, there was a, a bus. There was... I never mentioned a bus. I made that up. There was something coming over a hill, a virus coming over a hill. There was 
She said public transport coming over the hill. She did, she did. Back in time as well, back to the future type thing. Bus coming over a hill, train coming over a... Bus coming over a hill is apparently something similar. There was no bus! <laughs> well, public transport coming over a hill then. Fine, <laughs> fine. I only think of buses when I think of public transport. There is just my... No, I don't want to guess. I want to keep rambling life for some more thoughts. Um, <laughs> well, do it silently and then have a guess. Okay, Josh, your interlude is over. A tram? No, it's close, and you have a second guess. Is it actually close? Yes. How close? Just have a guess. <laughs> a train. A steam train. Yes! Okay. <laughs> steam train. That was three guesses! Well done there, Josh. Yeah, we well there done, eventually. Josh. Cheating okay. always prevails. <laughs> okay, Victoria, do you want to guess Josh's? Okay, so you said something about a villain and something about an MRI scanner. Any thoughts? Something to do with brain disease? I wanted to see into his consciousness, but I didn't have the technology for an MRI scanner. A more natural way of doing it. Mind reading. Think of a single word that encapsulates <laughs> that. That was a second guess. Oh, that was oh. no way. Well, it wouldn't matter anyway, because uh, Josh said the word brain, and that was one of his words he couldn't say. Oh. It was actually telepathy. That was my next guess. <laughs> well, that's not the game, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of that round, Team Star, Gareth and Phil, they got the two points, and Team Knight, Josh and Victoria, they got the one point. Round four is the Curious Case of Mr. DeVries, and this round is for our team captains, that's Gareth and Victoria. Now, I've read some biographies recently that weren't that interesting, so I've taken the key moments from their lives, and I'd like our captains to rewrite the biography within a minute via simple, logical steps. Okay, we'll start with Victoria. And I'd like her to retell the story of Molly Kuhl. Oh. <laughs> Age 34. She's broke her canines. I want to know how. She can talk to penguins. I want to know why. And she can't see triangles. <laughs> and I'd like to know why. So you want to know the why of talking to penguins, not the how. <laughs> why or how? Interchangeable. And your minute starts now. Molly Kuhl, age 34, has had a severe dental problem all her life. She has broken her canines, but she's also broken all of her other teeth as well. <laughs> she, she didn't notice that she had broken her canines because they are triangular in shape and she has an inability to see triangles. <laughs> this is due to a deficiency of cone cells in her <laughs> eye. <laughs> so triangles cannot be seen. Anything remotely triangular... Is, is just, she cannot see it. Now, she went on a trip and saw some penguins at the zoo and found out she had a remarkable ability to talk to them. And we assume this is because she... It's, it's like Harry Potter can speak parcel tongue. She, she can speak penguin tongue. There's no rag, rational explanation for this, but it's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's a, it's a true biography. All of them are. Absolutely. Molly Q. I, I love how that was read in the style of when Victoria does it. It's like, it's a proper sort of, like an audio book. <laughs> Molly Cool, age 34. <laughs> sort of, that sounds like a, a funeral sermon. <laughs> yeah, alright, all that. I'd say it sounds more like the public service announcement warning against the deficiency of cone sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Eat small carrots, children. <laughs> It's a brilliant abstract slogan, isn't it? Eat more carrots, you'll see triangles. <laughs> how can it fail? I just, I can't understand how, due to a lack of being able to see triangles, she didn't realise all her teeth were broken. How did she break all her teeth? She had just a dental problem throughout her life. Oh, an unspecified problem. She may have had weak oh. enamel. Weak enamel and poor cone cells do often go together. Damn you, reasonable it's the same controlling <laughs> protein. So. Oh, he has actual information. I just make everything up, I say, on this. That is actually rubbish. <laughs> 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 Gareth, it's your turn, and I'd like you to tell the biography of Anthrax. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Age 12. <laughs> she became magnetic through an accident, and I want to know what that is. <laughs> like. uh, she was formerly known as Anne of the Apes. <laughs> and how does she how does she get that title? Okay. 
and she briefly believed she was a fire engine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, this, 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 this is doable, this is doable. Also funny, when I was five, I believed I was a fire engine. Oh, I don't okay. Just drank loads of water. <laughs> 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 nice. And then just started to burn things and put them out. <laughs> that's why I haven't got a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could save him <laughs> with a fireman's lift. But he was too heavy. I could lift him now. Did you have to put him down? <laughs> I had to put him out. <laughs> Before he set the house on fire. <laughs> Sorry. And you admit it starts now. Anne Thrax, uh, age 12, went on holiday with her parents when she was 11 uh, on a Concorde flight. Uh, Concorde was still around when she was 11. And they actually, it was a, it was a global circumference tour on Concorde of the equator. <laughs> How, however, due to the equator being equally equidistant, if you were to use the correct, correct term, correct, correct, between the North and South Pole, Concorde flew so fast... That actually generated magnetism, and she became magnetic. <laughs> However, due to the sudden increase in magnetism on the plane, the plane crashed onto into the Bermuda Triangle, which is located, <laughs> as we all know, on the equator. So um, <laughs> she crashed down on this island full of apes. Uh, it was sort of like Planet of the Apes, except the island was, was only about five foot long. So <laughs> with her knowledge of fire and sharp sticks, she became known as Anne of the Apes. <laughs> However, she actually suffered a brief delusional period on the island when, after becoming queen and uh, having thrown feces at people, being a queen of the apes, she believed she was a fire engine due to a mental breakdown. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, just, about, just about. When did Concord circumnavigate the equator? When you weren't looking, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of fire engine-like behaviour did she display? Um, well, there's the running around. There was the siren at the top of her voice. Um... And she constructed a crude fireman's hat out of mud and sticks while she was still Anne of the Apes. It was quite a densely packed island, I I think. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of there were a lot of accidents. I mean, she introduced fire to the apes, so of course they didn't really know what they were doing. It just <laughs> things and people. Well, people I say people, monkeys. I mean, I say monkeys. I mean apes. Caught fire um, a lot. So she had to take control somehow. I mean, she was queen, yes, but there was just no public safety department. Why did they want an eleven-year-old pyromaniac queen? They're apes, Josh. They don't know what they want. <laughs> just, you just need to show dominance. And that's why they're apes. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of that round, I think I'm going to give it a point each. Oh. Oh. So, <clears throat> Team Star, you have to win this final round to, to win the group. Last round is called Everything I Do, I Elaborate For You. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, oh, I yeah. love these titles. <laughs> they just get better every week. <sighs> and this is a round for everyone. I would like them to elaborate on a story for me. And they would take it in turns to add something to the story, but must repeat what was said previously. So we'll alternate between the two teams. And we'll start with Josh. And the story starts, a door opened. A door opened and in stepped a large Jamaican man carrying two and a half pounds of cheese, which he then proceeded to add onto a painting which was hanging on the wall of an art gallery in the southern part of Sweden. A door opened and a Jamaican man arrived with two and a half bags or pounds or other units of cheese which he put onto a painting as he was being held at gunpoint by Tracy Emin. A door opened. A large Jamaican man walked in carrying two and a half pounds of cheese which he then put onto a portrait hanging in a gallery and a gun was fired. A large Jamaican man walked through a door. He was carrying two and a half pounds of cheese which he smothered a painting with subsequently. (laughs) Being held at gunpoint by Tracy Emin, little did Tracy know that she was actually an agent of Damien Hirst, thus part of the secret alternative artist Illuminati. (laughs) (laughs) A door opened and in walked a large Jamaican man carrying two and a half pounds of cheese in which he proceeded to smother a painting before being shot at by Tracy Emin acting as an agent of Damien Hirst for the purposes of procuring large amounts of cocaine for the Swedish Mafia, which are going to be passed on to an agent in Russia in exchange for three AK-47s passed on to a tribe in remote Africa <laughs> who are going to use them to extort money from Bolivian terrorists. <laughs> Boom! Jamaican man, door opens, uh, he's putting cheese on a painting at the behest of that woman Tracy. I was talking about, Tracy Emin, who in turn was working under the influence of Damien Hurst, who was part of the Illuminati of young <laughs> British artists. <laughs> there was boom, arms trade, cocaine stuff, but Damien Hurst wasn't to steal the cocaine for himself because he wanted to use it to fill a dead shark. <laughs> <laughs> 
Door open. Jamaican man walks in. Cheese everywhere. Tr- Tracy Yemen. <laughs> Illuminati of young artists. Damien Hurst. Cocaine. Bolivian terrorists. Put three AK-47s and took them to a small African tribe and then there was a shark in the water. Jamaican man walks through a door carrying some cheese. His mission to smother a painting. But little <laughs> did he know he was being held at gunpoint by Tracy Yemen, working under Damien Hurst, the head of the British Illuminati, who was using this cheese to trade for AK-47s, some cocaine, and one really crazy terrorist Bolivian shark. A shark who wanted to blow up Toys R Us. <laughs> A door open in which a large Jamaican man who proceeds to smother every painting within the gallery with cheese. <laughs> this was watched on the watching auspices of Tracy Emin working as an agent provocateur for Damien oh. Hurst in his <laughs> trades for cocaine with Bolivian terrorists and AK 47s in Africa, with for some reason a shark involved in the vicinity. This shark had a vendetta against Toys R Us and was going to use this in order to try and spark up an international incident in Egypt <laughs> to bear some but not too much resemblance to the current problems going on there now which, as you will know by the time this goes out, end with President Mubarak being executed. <laughs> Night falls, a door opens, in walks a Jamaican man with some cheese on a painting, Tracy Evan Barr, but she's merely an agent of Damien Hurst, who in turn is merely an agent of the young British artist Illuminati. Meanwhile, shark full of cocaine, <laughs> uh, Bolivian drug lords with AK-47s, arms race, that's bad. Uh, something <laughs> happening in Egypt, and meanwhile the shark is trying to take over Toys R Us because it has a vendetta against Toys R Us due to their questionable manufacturing policies. <laughs> <laughs> a door opens, a Jamaican man walks in, smothered in cheese. He walks in <laughs> the painting, smothering them in cheese too. Tracy Yemen comes in, holding the Jamaican man at gunpoint. There is cocaine involved, and Bolivian terrorists take a shark to Toys R Us, but it's a stuffed shark full of cocaine, and there was Egypt, and decapitation, etc. A cheesy Jamaican man walks in and starts playing <laughs> 80s music while smothering paintings <laughs> in cheese. Held at gunpoint by Tracy Emmett and Damien Hurst, part of the great British artist Illuminati. There's cocaine, there's guns, there's sexy Bolivians, and there's a terrorist shark who wants to get rid of Toys R Us because of Christmas of 1999, he could not get a Buzz Lightyear doll for his young <laughs> ch- uh, shark son. His shark son, who grew up to be in prison due to that uh, the lack of that Buzz Lightyear doll, and is now a drug mule for the very Jamaican man who smothered those paintings in cheese. And they all lived happily ever after. Phil, will you please do a talk show when you're old? <laughs> <laughs> Sharks full of cocaine, that is bad. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of that round, I give both points to Team Star. That's Gareth and Phil. So well done. Ahem. So, at the end of the show, the points are Team Star, six points. Ooh. Team Knight, five points. <gasps> Yay! Touch me, Philip. Team Star, you've you've won. That's Gareth and Phil. Uh, that means you've won the group, and you go through to the final. Oh, I'm gonna die! And you also get to choose a song. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we all have "Who Are You" by the Who. I'd just like to thank both our teams. That's Team Star, Gareth Monk, and Phil Carruthers. Thank you very much. And Team Knight, Joshua Pink and Victoria Rice. And you know. I've learnt something today. I've learnt that Mensa had a group outing at the Nativity. <laughs> Swine aside is deferred bacon. <laughs> it's possible to be a fire engine, head of the fire department, and queen of apes simultaneously. And live sharks are best used for smuggling cocaine and Buzz Lightyear toys. I've been Rory Cook. You've been listening to A Mara Fiction. Good night. Holy Free Holies, what an incredible show. If you would like to get involved in Comedy in Bangor, look up Bangor Comedy on Facebook. Or you can send us an email to comedy at undev.bangor.ac.uk. <laughs>